Hello, professor. Good evening, Maria. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas to you too. Thank you. Do you think somebody else is coming? I don't know. Shall we start off then? Oh, okay. I'm. I think that you can start. Yeah. Should we remember what we were doing last time? We're talking about uh, Aristoteles, um, Plato, and uh, the difference between both the schools about sophism. Sophism. <clears throat> so we talk um, mainly, mainly uh, this. Uh, mainly this. Yes. I was actually talking about the influence of uh, Parmenides on Socrates. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I did talk about Aristotle and uh, Plato. Uh -huh. Now, in terms of method, Let's talk about Plato today. Okay. Yeah. And, and also, I, I, you, you told last time that we, that you're going to explain the difference between uh, Politeia um, and the Republic, or something like this, about the polis also. Yes. Mm -hmm. See, a lot of people think. Politia is something that came out of the polis. That is not the case. The case actually is that uh, the politia is what led to the emergence of the polis, technically. Technically, that's what it is. Okay, though today we all say that uh, it is uh, uh, the polis, which is the basis of politia. It's actually the other way around. So let's get on to what politia is. Because, like I said, that is the name of the book that uh, Plato wrote. And uh, he basically wanted a certain kind of a politia. A politia is a in this case, you should take it as a place where rational people lived. That's how you'll have to try and look at this. So, if you see Plato, Plato was very influenced by Socrates, needless to say. And he was also in, 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 uh, very much uh, influenced by Parmenides and Zeno to a certain extent. Now, 
to understand Plato, we'll have to make a small reference once again to the Milesian school. The Milesians basically believed that the world was outside of them, that you had to investigate the world in order to get knowledge of it, in order to understand it and to have knowledge of it. That is what the Milesians believed in. But like I said, Parmenides believed in the opposite. For Parmenides, everything was in the mind. And for him, the world was still unmoving. Not that it moved. Any kind of movement for him was absolutely an illusion or illusory, I-L-L-U-S-O-R-Y, illusory, as he called it. For him, nothing moved in the world. The world was a stillness. Now, if you look at Plato, Plato is somebody who is against what he saw in the case of uh, the Milesians. He did not believe that uh, you had to investigate the world and find out what it is. He was, to a certain extent, impressed by Parmenides. And this Im impression, I mean, the fact that he was impressed was because of the fact that Parmenides believed that everything was in the mind. Now, Parmenides influenced a number of people in a different way, in different ways, sorry. One of the persons he had some influence on was Pythagoras. Uh, you must be aware of Pythagoras, a mathematician. That is how everybody knows him. But Pythagoras was a philosopher, not just a mathematician. He was a mathematician. In fact, if you look at it, in the good old days, logic, was something that was considered to be a part of mathematics. And since logic was a part of mathematics, most of the philosophers pursued mathematics. The only philosopher who did not, in antiquity that is, uh, who really did not pursue mathematics is Aristotle, uh, but I'll talk about that when we come to Aristotle as such. But for now, I want to tell you that Pythagoras was a very, very big influence on Plato. Pythagoras believed in the existence of souls, S-O-U-L-S. Are you aware of his theorem, anyone? 
Okay. Pythagoras Yamaria. Again, uh, Professor? Sorry? Could you please repeat? Are you aware of the Pythag Pythagorean theorem? Mm. P -Y -P -H -O -G -R -E -S, Pythagoras. No, no, just in mathematics, these kind of things, the triangles and this kind of things, but not like philosopher. Yeah, but do you remember, do you know his theorem? No. Okay. If you look at his theorem, his very, very famous theorem, which is something very well known and which is something we all studied in school here. He believed that, uh, I told you that most of the Greeks were those who were interested in, uh, they were basically interested in, uh, what should I say, uh, geometry more than anything else. And so Pythagoras is no exception. Pythagoras basically uh, had this theorem. The square in a right angle triangle, that is what he says, in a right angle triangle, the square on the hypotenuse, hypotenuse is that long line. If this is the triangle, okay, so this long line here is the hypotenuse. The square on the hypotenuse is equal to the square on the sum of the other two sides. So if we say A, B and hypotenuse is C, the square on the hy on C is equal to the sum of the squares uh, on the other two sides, which is A and B, okay? So that is the famous Pythagorean the theorem. And uh, we had riders. <clears throat> riders were those which were derivatives of the theorem. And we had to solve those riders. Even in our time, people believed that you had to know mathematics to understand logic. And uh, if you understood mathematics, then it was believed, it was believed that you could think logically, which is not entirely untrue. It is not entirely untrue. It is quite true. Anyway, so, Pythagoras, for most people, uh, at least in India, is just a mathematician. He's considered to be somebody who was interested in geometry and that he pursued geometry. And he created these theorems and the riders around them, which is only partly true. In fact, you miss the bigger story if you think of, uh, if you basically think of uh, Pythagoras as just a mathematician. Because the bigger story is Pythagoras was a person who was into 
different things. A person who believed in different things and all these things were in the nature of the occult, O-C-C-U-L-D. I hope you are familiar with the term occult. Occult basically means that it is about things that you cannot see, things that you cannot feel, things that are not tractable to the senses. So, off late, of course, thanks to horror films, of which I'm a very big fan, every night I watch a horror film. They're great fun. Real comedies are horror films. Anyway, but let's not talk about that. Uh, if you look at the idea of occult, it has come to be associated with negative things like black magic, horror, and, uh, you know, somehow dismembering the whole idea, the whole idea of being human. So that is what it has come to be. So you have to understand that that is not what occult is. Occult is something that is not tractable to the senses. That's all. Okay. But then the question is, if it is not tractable to the senses, where is it coming from? Now, for somebody like Plato, I'm sorry, Pythagoras, for somebody like Pythagoras, the most important thing to understand was the fact that everything that you see in the outside world is not knowledge. For him, knowledge was in the form of the soul, the soul that people had. In ancient India, there was a belief of the soul. And this particular belief of the soul is very different from the Greek belief and the, and specifically speaking, uh, the belief of Pythagoras. In India, in ancient India, people believed in the soul, even today people believe in the soul, but they believe it in a slightly different manner. In ancient India, it was believed that everything in the universe had a soul. The universe itself was a soul. And therefore, all the constituent elements of the universe were nothing but soul. So even grains of sand, small grains of sand, were supposed to have soul. Animals had souls. This that belief is something that persists even today. That is the reason why we have so much talk about the cow. We have so much talk about the cow because if you look at the Vedas, especially the Rig Veda, it talks about the whole idea of a transmigration of the soul, which is the soul starts life 
in living forms which are extremely small and as it gets refined if it gets refined then it gets into higher forms of life and the highest form of life that a soul can occupy is the human beings life but before that but before that it is the cow the cow is the one that is considered to be the repository of the soul uh before the soul enters a human body depending on what it is so the cow worship that you see in india not the gau rakshaks or the cow rakshaks i'm not talking about these people i'm talking about the idea that existed even in the ancient period so if you look at the ancient period what you see is that there is the idea that the cow is holy it is holy because you become a human being because you became a cow if you became a cow then you would become a holy you would become a human being automatically uh, if you look at various animals people associated a number of negative qualities they associated a number of negative things with other animals but when it came to the cow people believed that the cow was a noble animal the cow is a noble animal and because of the fact that the cow is a noble animal it cannot be wrong it does not make anything it does not do anything which is bad well some people have taken it to the extreme which is of course a totally uh, different issue that they have taken it to this extreme so what you need to understand is a simple thing that the cow is the repository of the soul and once you become a once it enters a cow the soul automatically comes to the human being unlike the cow the human being can be very bad the human being can be very bad he can basically he or she can lose the goodness that was there in the cow now Pythagoras didn't have this kind of an idea. For him, it was only human beings who had souls. This is a belief that still persists in the West. The Jews, the Christians, and the uh, muslims well, well muslims are not really technically the west but they all believe that it is only the uh, uh they believe that it is only the human being who has a soul other forms of uh, life animals do not have a soul that is what is the belief
And this belief was something that was very, very strongly held by Pythagoras. Now, Pythagoras didn't stop by saying, well, we all have a soul. He didn't stop by saying that. He said that it is the soul that makes people come together. People of similar souls, souls which are similar to each other. Like we say, look, I don't know, for some reason I like this chap. He's my friend. Or you look at somebody and say, I don't like him. I don't think I want him to be my friend. And I don't know about you people, but this has definitely happened in my life where I have met somebody and I have taken an instant liking to them and they reciprocated that instant liking to me. And we have become friends. Some of my best friends are those whom I did not go to school with. These are not people who came into my life when I was very young. They came into my life almost when I was doing my graduation, just before that, undergraduation. And uh, they remain my friends. They remain my friends, though they have gone away to the US. We regularly do Zoom calls. We do all these things. Now, the thing that you need to understand is that somehow there is a force that brings people together. Somehow there is a force that brings people together. And there is a force that also repels people. You don't like some people. You look at them and you say, I don't like him. You see those kind of things. Right, so that is what Pythagoras is talking about. He says there are like souls. Like souls are not those which are like souls or akin to souls, but souls which are akin to each other. Your soul and somebody's soul, if they are similar, then you bond. You bond and you become friends or you become whatever. Okay, you may bond and become friends or you become anything. Blood brothers. There was once a time in America when the Africans wanted to demonstrate to the white people that these people were forming their own clan. So what did they do? They used to cut their wrist here. The other person would cut his wrist and they would put one wrist, one person's wrist on the other person. And then they said, we are blood brothers. 
united by blood and that is how we will remain for the rest of our lives that is basically what you find in uh, america now this particular practice was not started by the blacks or the africans in america it was actually first started by pythagoras pythagoras believed in cults c u l t s a cult is a group of people who liked each other who were like each other and they believed that they had a common purpose to achieve in this world that is what pythagoras said and so these people will all become uh as far as pythagoras is concerned there will be people who will all become blood brothers and pythagoras also started the idea which today we find in language i don't know if any of you do crossword puzzles if you do crossword puzzles then you find that there are things which are called clues okay in order to fill a blank space with a word you get a clue you also get what are called cryptic clues a general clue is a clue okay let me say have you heard of plato and you will say no have you heard of aristotle you will say yeah so the clue will be plato is someone who comes from where aristotle is from where aristotle comes from so that's an open clue it's a very very open clue a cryptic clue is known only to the members of a crypt which is a closed group it is not an open group of people not an open group of friends i told you i made friends with so many people instantly but these are all open friendships they are not closed secret friendships the crypts c r y p t s the crypts that pythagoras talked about were not open they were closed a crypt by definition is something which is hidden something which is closed by definition it is hidden and closed so when you look at this whole idea of a crypt clue what you are saying is that there is something which is hidden and it is not so easy to find so pythagoras created these scripts he created these scripts and he came up with the idea 
he came up with the idea that people in crypts should be like blood brothers, like what we are calling blood brothers in the modern period. So the idea of slashing wrists and putting them on top of each other, that is something which started in the Greek times, ancient Greek times, not with the Africans in America. It started with Pythagoras because Pythagoras had a belief the belief that Pythagoras had was that if people put their uh, arms like this and became blood brothers, then the thing is they are asking to be brothers forever. So what is being brothers forever? Brothers forever is Plato, not only, not Plato, I'm sorry, Pythagoras not only believed in the idea of souls, existing in human beings, he also believed in reincarnation. He believed in reincarnation. And he thought that if people basically became members of a crypt, and if they did this ritual, then they will be born again and again as brothers, blood brothers, not own brothers, but blood brothers. They'll be born again and again as blood brothers. So this is the most important thing that you must remember when you're talking about Pythagoras. And he believed all this happened in the mind. He believed in destiny and he believed that this was all predetermined. Who will become blood brothers? who will become crypts, members of a crypt. All this was predetermined. It was not something that people decided for themselves. This was something which is predetermined. And so you see the idea of the soul and the idea of predetermination of various things basically was something that you find in Pythagoras. Now, why have we talked so much about Pythagoras? Because the influence of Pythagoras not just Socrates, not just Socrates, the influence of Pythagoras on Plato is very, very evident, very evident. Plato was somebody who believed in most of the things Pythagoras believed, including being a mathematician. So Plato's idea of knowledge 
where does knowledge come from where does it sit how do people know what is what and what is not all these things were those which were known to uh to plato thanks to pythagoras so tomorrow we'll start doing plato's conception of knowledge we will finish doing plato's conception of knowledge and how he arrived at this highest form of living which is politia so thank you very much thank you sir yeah so i think christmas we should take a day off mm. yeah so i'll see you on monday okay i'll okay. see you on monday because i don't know about the others but definitely maria will need to celebrate yeah. christmas so yeah. merry christmas to you maria enjoy your uh, you and all oh, thank you yeah. thank you so much i also put a christmas tree in my house by the way just for... this is my first christmas outside uh, alone for yes outside mm-hmm. venezuela yes mm-hmm. okay okay <laughs> so i'll give you a call and say merry christmas tomorrow <laughs> sure all right. sure professor all right okay okay bye thank bye thank you everyone thank you. see you tomorrow thank bye you rather monday see you on monday, monday. monday. okay bye bye thank you